The stories of Abimelech and Jephthah seem very different in terms of their general messages. Abimelech's story is about inter-Israel conflict and ambition run amok. Jephthah's story is about deliverance from oppressors and unwise vows. But nonetheless, there are some common themes that link these two stories to one another, besides just the fact that they're juxtaposed in the Book of Judges. Both stories begin with a conflict between siblings. Both involve a man who aspires to become a ruler, and both also involve a tragic slaughter of young people. So different though they may be, there's enough similarity here to give us a sense of continuity in the ongoing narrative. The story of Abimelech is one that's frequently passed over by preachers and devotional Bible readers. It is a disquieting narrative in many ways. It's a morality tale of what happens when a judge aspires to be king. Gideon had explicitly refused kingship, but he did establish the beginnings of a dynasty himself with 70 sons serving as circuit-riding judges. But one of his sons, Abimelech, whose name means something like, my father is king, decides to become the sole ruler. He conspires with the people of the city of Shechem to kill his brothers. Only one of the brothers, Gideon's youngest son, manages to escape. Abimelech was then crowned king of Shechem. Not king of all Israel, just the king of this one region from which his mother had come. When Abimelech is crowned, the son who escaped, Jotham, tells this little parable about trees and it pronounces something of a curse on Abimelech, something that the ancient world took very seriously. Then Jotham fled, leaving Abimelech and the people of Shechem to their fate. Next, we're told that God sent a troublemaking spirit to stir up strife between Abimelech and the people of Shechem in order to avenge the deaths of Gideon's sons. A fellow named Gaal, obviously a wealthy Shechemite who threw good parties, roused up the people to rebel against Abimelech. But Abimelech's officer in the city conspired with Abimelech, and together they lured Gaal and his men out into the fields. Abimelech's forces fought against Gaal's forces, and Gaal was driven from the city. But that wasn't enough to satisfy Abimelech. He still wanted revenge against a town that he rebelled against. Him. So the next day, he attacked the people while they were out working in their fields. Then he attacked the city itself. He killed its people. He sowed the place with salt, which was also a kind of curse, apparently. Then he pursued the people from the suburbs of Shechem to the temple of El Barit, and he burned them alive inside that temple. Then, inexplicably, Abimelech went to besiege Thebes. There it was that he met his doom when he was killed by a millstone that was dropped from a tower by a woman. Jephthah's story is more traditionally centered on a judge, but this judge is unlike any that we've seen yet in this book begins with a typical fashion. The Israelites have been wicked. God has given them over into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites. Finally, the Israelites repent of their sins and they cry out to God. But at this point, God isn't interested in hearing from them. When they seem to have truly repented, God decides to deliver them. But on the other hand, it appears that the Israelites in Gilead have chosen their own deliverer, this fellow Jephthah. And what a deliverer he is! Illustrious background? Well, no, actually it's just the opposite. He's the son of a prostitute who's been driven from his home by his brothers. Like Abimelech, he assembles his own private army, but instead of conquering cities, he raids caravans. But he's very good at what he does. So when the people of Gilead decide they need a savior, they call upon Jephthah. If he will deliver them, they say, they will make him a ruler. Not a king this time, but a ruler over the land of Gilead. So Jephthah sets out to set his people free. The story takes what seems to me at least to be a bit of a comic turn here. This great warrior decides to take action against the Ammonites by writing them a letter. Jephthah asks in the letter why the Ammonites are attacking Israel. The king of Ammon responds with his own letter, basically saying that the Israelites are claiming land that rightfully belongs to the Ammonites. 
the land of Gilead bordered right on the kingdom of Ammon, so it's easy to see how he could have gotten that impression. Jephthah responded with a very long letter explaining how the Israelites had driven the Amorites out of the land of Gilead, and that the Ammonites, in spite of their geographical proximity, had never actually ruled that portion of the land. So Gilead rightly belonged to Israel. The Ammonites should contend themselves with the land that their God has given to them. Interesting bit of theology, that. Anyway, the king of Ammon refuses to listen to Jephthah. So Jephthah prepares for war. Now we're told the Spirit of the Lord finally comes upon Jephthah. And it is here, interestingly enough, that he makes his foolish vow. If the Lord gives me victory over the Ammonites, whatever first comes out of the door of my house when I come home will be offered as a sacrifice. Now, in those days, a large house typically had two stories. The upper story was where people slept. The lower floor was where the animals were kept. People typically weren't inside the house during the day since they did a lot of their work outdoors. So Jephthah might well have expected one of his animals to come out of the house to meet him. Well, however, we all know the outcome of this vow. Jephthah goes out, he gets his victory, and when he returns home, his only child, his daughter, comes out of the house to meet him. Jephthah tells his daughter of the vow, and she tells him that he's obligated to keep it. She only wants 60 days to mourn the fact that she will never have children to carry on the family line. And so they establish a tradition in Israel of mourning the daughter of Jephthah. In my mind, there's no question of the fact that Jephthah offered his daughter as a human sacrifice. There's also no doubt in my mind that he shouldn't have done so, vow or no vow. The Bible strictly forbids human sacrifice, though it's very likely that Jephthah had never read the Bible. Jephthah was acting on what he believed was right. In his mind, keeping a vow trumped the terror of killing his own daughter. This story illustrates just how confused the Israelites had become at this time about matters of moral import. But even greater horrors are yet to come. Thank you.